So welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Karen Rader. I'm the director of the Science, Technology, and Society program, which is sponsoring this event. And I have to mic myself. So here we go. I, again, I'm Dr. Karen Rader. I'm the director of the Science, Technology, and Society program, which is sponsoring this event. I want to say just a few words before we introduce Dr. Hannes about what we're doing this year. This year, the STS lecture series, Science Fact, Science Fiction, is our theme. We are staging an exploration of how representations of science and scientific ideas in the media and culture relate to actual scientific practices. <laughs> and in turn, how these representations are understood, and by understood, I also mean misunderstood, understood, interpreted, and circulated in society. Such a project, we believe, is timely and necessary in the context of larger cultural discussions at the moment. So, for instance, those about post-truth and alternative facts. But this topic also has a scholarly feature. The definition of facts and the line between facts and knowledge of all kinds, even when knowledge comes from fictions. I have some English people out there, so you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. That, that set of problems is a classic boundary problem in the interdiscipline that our program represents at VCU, Science and Technology Studies. There is much misunderstanding and or, I think, really lack of communication on this front, especially between scientists and SDSers. So astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, a top scientist in his own right, but also a top Twitter scientist, <laughs> recently tweeted, quote, in school, rarely do we learn how data become facts, how facts become knowledge, how knowledge becomes wisdom, unquote. Historian of technology Alex Wellerstein quickly responded, quoting again, Quote, no offense, Neil deGrasse Tyson, but this is literally the kind of thing we teach in the history of science, <laughs> science and technology studies, etc. So, STS speakers this year, scientists and STS scholars among them, because we're really interested in the mix, will use their research and experiences to address these issues. They will address the problem of failure in science, failure both as a method and as the side effect of failed public education about scientific methods. We're going to have a, someone who comes and talks to us about climate modeling, someone who was <laughs> at the University of South Florida and literally had to make his own decision <laughs> about whether to stay or go in the wake of, or in the, while facing the hurricane based on modeling. Several of our speakers will explore issues of the misrepresentation of large analytic categories, race and ethnicity, gender and disability, local and global, in scientific policy problems as varying as the diversity issue in STEM, and the plight of the vanishing bumblebee. <laughs> the series will include two panel discussions, one in the fall and one in the spring, in collaboration with VCU's Humanities Research Center, celebrating and reflecting on the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So there's a lot more to say, but not now, since I know that's not where you're here. <laughs> I just want to put this up here. This is our web page. We also have a Facebook and a, a Twitter feed. So just search for uh, SDS at VCU, and you should be able to find more information if you want. So before I introduce Dr. Hammonds, I need to say a few brief but necessary words of thanks and acknowledgement on behalf of myself and Dr. John Powers, who is in the back, Assistant Director of STS. As always, the STS program is fortunate to be able to consistently rely on its home department and other VCU collaborators for support. This includes the VCU Department of History and its chair, John Nebo, uh, Dr. Charlene Crawley in Chemistry and Inter Interdisciplinary Sciences. I know some of her students are sitting here. And in this talk, we had further support from the BEA, the Black Educators Association, and the Black Students Association, the BSA. This particular talk is close to my heart because it was made possible not only through the program support of the College of Humanities and Sciences, headed by Dean Monsi Fuentes, who is here today, but also through the support of the National Science Foundation. NSF made possible community-engaged research with Science Pub RBA, that's the Science Cafe that is connected to the Science Matters Initiative which is in turn connected to CIS, that's our local PBS radio and television affiliates. So in that work, which has led us here, I want to thank Cynthia Gibbs, Science Pub RBA director, and my research collaborator, as well as the numerous community liaisons and community members with whom we both work, specifically Jerome Legions and the Carver Community Association, and Tito Luna of the VCU Division of Community Engagement, and last but certainly not least, the focus group, whose members must remain nameless, but who gave us thoughtful and important feedback <laughs> about the kinds of topics that might broaden our audience and accessibility. So, without further ado, 
Dr. Evelyn Hammonds is the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of History of Science, the department which she now heads, chairs, as well as Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. She has written too many books and important articles to mention them all specifically, but her work has a really impressive span in depth in STS. Her research, as she describes it, focuses on the intersection of scientific, medical, and sociopolitical concepts of race in the United States. And I would just add, in cases as diverse as late 19th and early 20th century diphtheria epidemic, the contemporary AIDS epidemic, a really broad um, geographical and, um, and medical span. She is currently completing two more books. The first, A History of Biological, Medical, and Anthropological Uses of Racial Concepts. That book is called The Logic of Difference. A History of Race and Science and Medicine in the United States, 1850 to 1990. And the second, a reader on race and gender in science, co-edited with Rebecca Herzig and Abigail Bass. She has won national and international recognition via multiple awards, fellowships, professional societies for her work, which started, I learned last night, in her initial career in sciences, she worked at Bell Labs. So someone can ask her about that. <laughs> Professor Hammonds eventually earned a PhD in history of science at Harvard, but not before she earned a graduate degree in physics from MIT and two undergraduate degrees, one in electrical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and another in physics from Spelman College. She taught at MIT before coming to Harvard, and while at MIT, she founded the Center for the Study of Diversity in Science, Technology, and Medicine. It is this topic about which she will enlighten us further today, so please join me in giving a warm BC welcome to Dr. Evelyn Hammonds. Thank you, Karen, um, for that lovely introduction. And I want to thank uh, Karen Rader and John Powers for, and everybody who helped make, uh, uh, who worked on making uh, my visit here uh, possible. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to be here with you all today. So what I want to talk about um, begins with uh, an issue that since at least the mid-1970s, uh, there have been extensive government, business, private philanthropic efforts to increase the number of white women and native-born people of color, or native-born minorities, in the scientific and technical workforce. So the problem of the absence of persons from such groups in science and engineering has been characterized in many ways, but most notably it's been called the pipeline problem. I hate that term, but that's what people call it. Uh, and that is that there are too few minorities and women moving through the educational system in scientific and technical fields. So this well-worn pipeline metaphor has stood for over 30 years uh, as both a statement of how scientists and engineers are produced and as an expression of the failure uh, to bring, uh, to move minorities and women through this pipeline system. So, in spite of some of the notable successes in bringing visibility to the pipeline problem uh, of women and minorities in science and engineering, what I want to focus on today is one group remains significantly underrepresented in these fields, and that's women of color. Women of color are the smallest group of women in scientific and technical fields. So in this talk, what I want to do is a couple of things. So I'll begin with a short discussion of some of the numbers just to give you a sense of the kind of picture of the underrepresentation of women of color in STEM fields. So STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and I do include uh, medicine as well. Um, then I want to discuss some of the issues behind the numbers, uh, the unquantifiable aspects of this issue, which I'm calling the marginalization of experience. And lastly, just to sketch out some of the policy implications of this marginalization, both for women of color and for science and engineering. So for the sake of this talk, I'm going to talk about African American women, um, Asian American women, Latino Latinos, uh, Chicanos and Chicanos, and other groups, uh, including Native Americans, who are underrepresented in scientific and technical fields. So for me, I've been writing and thinking about women of color in science since the late 1970s, because I am a woman of color in science. And my interest in this issue began as a personal de desire to understand my own experiences as a physics and engineering student. And it subsequently grew into a professional and intellectual project since I began my studies in the history of science in the late 1980s. And that 
transition I can talk a little bit more about later. Uh, but it really came about because as a science and engineering student, I kept looking around the room and saying, why am I the only black woman here? What, I know a lot of smart black people who can do science and math and engineering, and why aren't they here? And so my physics professor would say, that is not a physics problem. You are here to do physics. And I'd say, okay, I gotta go somewhere where I can do this problem because I really need to understand this problem. And that's how I ended up in the history of science. That's the short version of the story. So for almost three decades, I have been trying to understand the following questions. Why have there been so few women of color in the sciences and engineering in the United States historically? Why have efforts to increase the number of white women and men of color in some of these fields been far less successful in producing more women of color? How are gender differences within racial and ethnic categories understood in science and engineering? And what does the experience of women of color tell us about cultures within these fields? Why has homogeneity in scientific and engineering cultures been so highly valued and tenacious, tenaciously held onto even as other professional fields have opened their ranks to many more people of color? So I'm gonna focus on just one of these questions this afternoon. So, uh, what does the experience of women of color in these fields tell us about the cultures within science and engineering? So let me just to get a brief look at the numbers, and I'm going to use the 2,000 numbers because I think uh, the point I want to make is not much has changed in 17 years. Um, as of 2000, African Americans were 12% of the U.S. population, about 3% of the total science and engineering workforce. Hispanics were 11% of the population and also about 3% about of the workforce. Native Americans about 1% of the population, less than one half of 1% of scientists and engineers. Um, and engineers and scientists from these groups tend to work more in social sciences, sciences um, increasingly a little bit in computer and mathematical sciences than other fields. So we have um, African Americans represent 5% of social scientists, 4% of computer and mathematical sciences, scientists, and roughly 3% or less of physical scientists and engineers. In the academic arena, specifically, underrepresented minorities represent about 5 to 6% of the academic doctoral employment in the physical, life sciences, mathematics, and engineering, but only about 3% in computer and environmental sciences. Now, we know that the number of women in science and engineering has increased steadily over the last decade, but for African American women in particular, between 1975 and the early 1990s, 75, it did it again, I did not touch it. Okay, I'll try. You can hear me, did it just sound okay? All right, I'll keep going. Between 1975 and 1992, 75% of African American women who were awarded doctorates in the sciences, um, in biology in specifically, earned their undergraduate degrees from two historically black institutions. Okay. That would be, because I'm, am I making you distracted? <laughs> okay, all right. And those institutions were Spelman College and Bennett College. Okay. Two institutions produced 75% of African American women who had undergraduate, uh, who ended up uh, getting doctorates in the sciences. That is amazing, okay? Yet, despite the achievements of people coming from those two institutions, and Spelman College is my undergraduate institution, um, the number of women of color in these fields remains so small that up until very recently, they were not even counted in national data sets. And overall, since the 1990s and early 2000s, not much has changed about these numbers. And that's why it's become a very important and significant national issue. These numbers are useful in that they tell us where women of color are and where they are not in scientific and technical fields. These numbers tell us that most women of color are still likely to be the only women of color in their departments, which means they experience a lot of iso isolation, but also special scrutiny. We know that these women are very much on their own, having to find individual solutions 
the cultural and intellectual challenges they face in graduate school and then in the workplace and beyond, as well as in college. They work in environments shaped by men who generally hold and exercise almost all, all power and control in science. Now, there's also a great deal that these numbers don't tell us. They, they don't reveal what these women make of their experiences, how they evaluate their careers in science and engineering. We know little about where they find encouragement and support. Um, we know even less about why they continue to work in scientific and technical fields despite the barriers they face. And lastly, we know almost nothing about how these women structurally located at the margins of science uh, and engineering and technical fields, how they view this enterprise. Have many of you seen Hidden Figures? And most of you went into the movie, I bet, thinking, I had no idea, right? that women, uh, especially African-American women, were involved so significantly in the mathematical, um, solving the mathematical problems that made space flight possible for the United States. But all of what I've just commented on is not news to anybody who studies women and minorities in science. Yet, in almost over 30-something years of looking at these questions, the lives of women of color in science have remained largely understudied. And that's what's so marvelous about this incredible movie that goes into the stories of women who are working even a decade, decades earlier than the period that I'm talking about. Um, so by and large, studies of women's participation in science and engineering have sought to explain why women lag behind men. That's been the first thing people tried to look at. And initially, many of these studies seek to explain this lag in terms of what was lacking in women. So it was women's inability to do quantitative work, or that was an early explanation, followed by more recent times the suggestion that women opt out of science and engineering because they have a difficult time balancing family commitments with scientific and technical work. Now, many of these studies come perilously close to making science and, and engineering to these very special kind of fields that are different from all other professions. And they also come pretty close to blaming the women as victim of their own choices, as victims of their own choices. So for too long, with respect to women of color, most analysts simply threw up their hands. And they said, people from these groups, women and men of color, um, they argued sometimes, lack the capacity to do a certain kind of quantitative work that science and engineering demand. And this is a perception that I think is, is still widely shared. But it goes back at least until the night uh, as back to as far as the 1930s. On the liberal side, uh, people argued that all we need to do is change the climate within science and engineering for white women and men of color, and it'll change for women of color. People don't believe that women of color have any specific issues, concerns, or histories that need to be addressed, either by academic institutions or um, private foundations or government agencies like the NSF or the NIH. So that answer suggests that critical mass is the answer to whatever problems these women face. Pure achievement within the sciences and engineering will lead to acceptance. But it remains an open question, however, whether critical mass can be attained for women of color in the sciences. Furthermore, nobody knows whether when the first woman of color wins a Nobel Prize in science, her success will open doors to other women of color. So as I said, it remains an open question whether when the first black woman or first woman of color wins a Nobel Prize in science, her success will open the doors to other women of color. So it's a, it's a kind of bleak picture. Not exactly what you really want to think about on a bright and sunny <laughs> afternoon here in the fall in school. But I think this is important because if we want to have a different future, if we want to have science and technology be something that everybody who has the talent to do it can do it and succeed, then we need to understand the roots of this problem. That's why we're sitting here on a bright and sunny afternoon. So what I've called this is the marginalization of experience. So in her important paper, um, The Evidence of Experience, the historian Joan Scott says, experience is a subject's history. And so for historians writing about those who are different some, from some presumed and usually unstated norm in science, 
Scott argued that it's necessary to historicize experience. That is, we have to try to understand, quote, the operations of the complex and changing processes by which identities are ascribed or resisted or embraced and which processes themselves are unremarked and indeed achieve their effect because they are not noticed. Hence the title of Margot Chevalier's book, Hidden Figures. They were hidden in plain sight, right? But, but how do we understand the processes that made their work and their contribution not visible to many, many people in the scientific and technical workforce and even many people at NASA itself? How do we understand how that happened? Some of it has to do with formal uh, discriminatory practices, but other aspects have to do with the cultures in which they work. And of course, the, as I said before, this focus on experience, I hope, will help us to mark more clearly what must and can be changed. So these experiences of women of color in science and engineering, they're not just hidden or invisible. These experiences have been mar marginalized. And as political theorists have argued, a group is marginal, quote, to the extent that its members have historically and continue to be denied access to dominant decision-making processes and institutions, stigmatized by their identification, isolated or segregated, and generally excluded from control over the resources that shape the quality of their professional and personal lives. Much of the material exclusion experienced by marginal groups is based on uh, or justified by ideological processes that define these groups as other or different. So I've tried to study or examine the marginalization of the experiences of women of color in science and engineering using both historical sources published in private interviews with contemporary uh, historical sources and published and private interviews with contemporary women. So let me turn to a couple of examples. In December 1975, 30 Native American, Mexican American, Puerto Rican, Black American women met under the auspices of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. These minority women, and that's the term they used to describe themselves at the time, um, in science, engineering, medicine, and dentistry, met to, quote, discuss their unique position as the most underrepresented and probably overselected group in the scientific discipline. This document, the report of this meeting, this was the first meeting on record of minority women in the pure and applied sciences in a wide range of disciplines from aerospace physics to zoology. They were diverse in age, in experiences, in backgrounds, in cultures. And despite this diversity, they articulated a common tie that bounded them together, that linked them together, which they call the double oppression of sex and race or ethnicity, plus the third oppression they called was the chosen career in science. Hence, the title of their meeting was called The Double Bind, The Price of Being a Minority Woman in Science. So in the preference to the report of this meeting, uh, William Carey, who was executive officer of the AAAS, noted that while minority women had participated in every panel and conference committee at the AAAS, their concerns had ostensibly been included in everything, but it had gradually become apparent, he said, that the special problems peculiar to minority women scientists were never addressed. He continued, minority women were in fact, he said, falling somewhere in between the funded efforts to improve scientific opportunities for minorities and efforts to advance women in science. This was the first time they'd ever brought these women together and asked them what their experience was. Since 1975, at the outset of what was going to be an incredibly historic meeting of minority women scientists, the executive officer of the AAAS identified the major flaw in existing efforts to, to build diversity in science. Despite all these programs they had to really foster greater inclusion, the unique, uh, the unique and special problems of minority women had never been addressed. There was little information on their status. There was virtually no literature that could advise institutions on the nature of the problem or the remedy. Now the conference was chaired by the African American biomedical researcher and educator Jewel Plummer Cobb, who was at the time uh, a member of the National Science Board, one of the highest 
uh, scientific organizations in the country. And Cobb noted that what brought these women together was this. Science careers in the context of gender and race or ethnic bias has been a major part of our lives, setting us apart at every turn, she said. Now we could address ourselves to the reasons for our small numbers, relative invisibility, and exclusion from mainstream science. So this is kind of a radical statement. It's very unflinching in its tone. It's unflinching in its assessment. And nearly 40 years later, people still don't understand it, even if they know about this. And the statement laid out what many analysts have really tried to avoid confronting, that minority women scientists saw their careers as part of an existing, as existing in a context of gender, race, and ethnic bias. And it was this bias that set them aside from their colleagues and produced a certain kind of isolation for them within these fields. And they further acknowledged that, the only, that only by talking about their experiences, by producing a collective narrative of their experience, could they begin to examine the reasons for their small numbers, their relative invisibility, and their ultimate exclusion from mainstream science. So there have been about uh, 200 people had applied to come to this meeting, and they ended up picking uh, about, um, I don't know, I think they picked about 60 folks or so to attend. Um, and it was, a, as I said, it was an extraordinary uh, moment. Um, the women who came recognized the monumental barriers that they had, they had overcome, but they also expressed concern for the hundreds of thousands of minority women that they also knew who had been excluded or systematically tracked out of the potential pool of scientific and technological human power, which was their turn. But in a profoundly optimistic spirit, they believed by articulating their issues that they could make a different future. And they felt that most of the time what they were experiencing were um, unconscious acts on the part of those in the scientific mainstream. So if only their colleagues could really understand uh, what was uh, their experiences, then the current system, which produced so few women sci minority women scientists, could be reversed. These women were not feminists. It's not a word they would have used. But, but they did profess a commitment to other women while distancing themselves from um, a feminist movement that they felt was not oriented toward their concerns. They had a nuanced and sophisticated view of the ways in which racism and sexism had affected them. Um, and they could recall many instances where they had experienced both bias uh, by that was about race or bias that was about gender, or sometimes it was about both, and it was impossible to determine which was which. Uh, but they knew that both hurt, no matter what. And this, they argued, was the very nature of the double bind that they were trying to explain. So what were these experiences that these women hoped to use to change the minds of policymakers and employers and educators? In the first sense, they wanted the scientific community to know who they were and where they came from. They described their early lives and, and how race and ethnicity and sometimes poverty had shaped their identities. Most had a deep desire for scientific knowledge. Many had parents who wanted them to study and encouraged them to study science. And others came from families where people had no understanding of scientific um, issues. Often they found support from teachers and other people outside of their families. For the women whose native language was not English, the ways in which the educational system failed them was also a source of frustration and hardship. In discussion of the years of their collegiate, graduate, and professional education, many of them talked about ed economic challenges uh, as they studied for their degrees. The high financial cost of a scientific education was something that was not possible for many of them to navigate easily. But their undergraduate years were the years where they began to feel a certain kind of isolation in their classrooms. They spoke of being excluded from study groups and sources of information about exams and research opportunities. They were especially bitter about the failure of professors and college administrators to acknowledge their isolation, or rather, if acknowledged, did so in a condescending kind of way. In a de facto sense, it, they were sanctioning the informal exclusion that these women experienced. And they also talked about professors who had very low expectations for them. So most importantly, these women were arguing that choosing a science major in and of itself marked a physical and psychological isolation, sometimes from their own racial and ethnic group, 
but also from other women and other groups of people um, in science. Now remember, these women were meeting in 1975 when their numbers in science and engin engineering were way lower than they are today. Almost none of them had ever had a professor who was a woman of color. Few grew up knowing any working scientists or engineers. And so when they chose these fields in college, they found that many people in their community simply didn't understand their choices. At the same time that this choice to do science separated them from different aspects of their community, they also felt that doing science demanded a certain kind of interaction on a daily basis that was alien to them. They specifically noted the demand to pretend indifference and to suppress sentiments about the environment or sociological impact of a technological or scientific issue on their community. And lastly, they spoke about family pressure to get married, to contribute to their communities of origins, and they couldn't figure out how to reconcile these issues with the demand for their works. So they, in the end, they offered a set of recommendations for policymakers. They wanted more financial support. Um, they wanted um, uh, help for minority women throughout their careers, uh, given their isolation in respective fields. They wanted universities and professional societies to make a more concerted effort to provide them with more explicit support, access to information, realistic professional advice. Uh, they wanted funding agencies to pay more attention to the absence of minority women scientists um, as grant recipients to make policies that would help them more actively uh, be able to uh, gain uh, grant support. They argued only when concern for minority women scientists and engineers is made explicit, only when their inclusion becomes a conscious part of funded education and research programs, will we begin to see a significant change in the participation of minority women in science. They wanted structural change in science that would allow them to be their whole selves. While analysts at the time of this meeting and into the, in, into the present have argued that minority women in science uh, face added burdens and that they often have to teach and mentor large numbers, larger numbers of students than their colleagues, these women felt that that was their duty. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to member, mentor students. They felt they understood the needs of other students of color wanted to provide as much help as they could. But they knew that that kind of service was not going to get them recognition and status within science. And they didn't ask that they be rewarded in some way for the special work. They just wanted to be able to be recognized for it because being an inspiration to students was very important to them. So these women articulated a different model of being a scientist. The scientist or engineer that these women aspired to be was one that was engaged in the world as a scientist and a citizen, one committed to the production of knowledge, production of new scientists, and the broader dissemination of scientific and technical knowledge to their community. That's the kind of scientists and engineers they wanted to be, not people locked away in some places doing work that had no relevance to individuals, but also had no relevance to their communities. But despite what they said, they found their careers in science, engineer, science and engineering and medicine to be exciting, demanding, and rewarding. Um, with extraordinary resilience and commitment, they had overcome many, many obstacles. And as the conference organizers note, quote, while reluctant to concede their own specialness, the participants in this conference were unanimous in their determination to change things so that other able minority women need not be so very special to have careers in science. So I read The Double Bind a few months after it was published. In the late spring of 1976, I had be just been accepted in the doctoral program in physics at MIT. And I wanted to study at MIT because I had recently met Shirley Jackson, who had just completed her PhD there. Uh, Jackson was, the, uh, was only the second African-American woman to earn a PhD in physics in the entire United States, and the first from MIT. As a footnote, you should know the first African-American man to earn a doctorate in phys physics did so when? Anybody know? Shirley Jackson's 1974, the first African-American man to earn a doctorate in physics did so in 1894. It's a 100-year gap almost, right? That's what I'm trying to talk about in terms of what we're talking about in terms of the space these women 
were able to take up. So during that spring, before I um, was applying to MIT, I tried to learn everything I could about black women scientists. So I did what I was supposed to do, and I hope many of you do. You go to the library and you say, where's the section on black women scientists? And the librarian said, what? What do you mean? There's no, I said, well, the books on black women scientists, you know, wh wh where are they? And she said, well, I have this report from this meeting called the Double Bind. That was the only thing there in the entire library. Back issues of Ebony Magazine with little paragraphs, you know, here's a black woman who had just kind of been a scientist and, you know, nothing else. That was it. I couldn't even write a, a report. That was it. Okay? And so, for me, this report was the first articulation of the world of science and engineering I was experiencing at Spelman College and Georgia Tech. And I could still re remember reading it and almost sobbing at different times. Um, the four other women that I went to school with at Spelman who were studying physics, we read passages of it to each other. I'm serious, kid. You, if you read a conference report and you get excited, that's really bad, right? <laughs> and that's pretty dull stuff. But we had nothing else that talked about what it meant to be a black woman scientist. So we were hungry for these words. And it's not unlike what many young people are doing today who are first encountering hidden figures. They're saying, oh my goodness, I didn't know this. I didn't know that people like me could become mathematicians or aeronautical in, uh, engineers. And so these kinds of, of events really touch a broad population in many ways who are hungry for stories to help see how they can become what they see on the screen or in the pages of a book. And that is what the double bind, the double bind report was my hidden figure, okay? And so for us, it was just not a dull conference report, uh, but it, we read it as a passionate and heartfelt description of the lives of women of color in science that captured our own experiences. They spoke to us, they spoke for us, they didn't ignore issues of diversity within each group of women of color represented. They addressed issues of class, community expectations. Oddly though, if there was one thing missing, it was the lack of discussion of the work they did itself. We knew their work mattered to them, but there was almost no discussion of why it mattered. What were the specific problems, questions, scientific issues that's so exciting, that was so exciting to them that they were willing to face all these ob obstacles in order to do the work. So we were really curious about this. How do you do this? How do you find the kind of work that is going to be sufficient and intellectually challenging and engaging enough to make you go through the kinds of things that they had described? That's not something you could find in the pages of that report. But even with this missing important piece, the double bind re uh, remained a document that many of uh, myself and many of my, my friends returned to many, many times in our careers. And I've come to know uh, several of the participants at this meeting, and they are very dear colleagues and ongoing inspiration for uh, my own work. Yet this report, while widely cited in the literature on women in science, has had a very limited influence in the field, largely because not a lot of people uh, even though it's cited, not a lot of people have really read it. Um, but few analysts and educators and policymakers have actually been able to do what the conference participants ask them to do. That is to take seriously that the experiences of women of color in science and engineering should be understood as reflecting a troubling, many troubling aspects of scientific and technical cultures that have to be actively and consistently addressed in order for participation of women from these groups to increase. Perhaps one of the limitations of the Double Bind Report was this kind of impersonal quality of an academic um, conference report. But it does re represent the collective voice of the group in an attempt to give some kind of sense of the experiences of the individuals in that group a legitimacy that their individual stories uh, could not accomplish. So there's one other story I wanted to tell you about that I think highlights um, the issues that uh, I'm trying to get you to understand. Um, as I said, there's still so much we don't know about the history of African American women science, scientists. We know virtually nothing about their scientific work, as I've said. 
and why it matters to them. And to this evidence, we have sort of lots of sketchy interviews that don't really probe very deeply into any aspect of their scientific careers, nor the institutions in which they work. And many of the interviews that we do have simply focus on the struggles that these women have to become scientists and engineers and to build viable careers instead of interrogating their scientific ideas and practices. And even when you see something that has lots of uh, uh, more in-depth interviews, it's really very interesting to note how, African, how women of color, and in specifically in this case, African American women are positioned. Uh, they're often told stories that sort of sit side by side with the stories of white women scientists and engineers, meaning that these women aren't given their own kind of individual um, agency. And let me give you an example of what I mean. A few years ago, there was a, 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 a video on uh, PBS, a series on women in science, that profiled a number of prominent women scientists. With careful attention to uh, diversity, they had profiles, included uh, a molecular biologist of Mexican descent and an African-American biochemist, Linda Jordan. Now, each profile depicted the woman scientists in the lab and outside the lab among family and friends. And I use these videos in my gender and science class because the stories they tell are interesting, speak to many issues about women in science, Yet, I found that using the Linda Jordan video left my students feeling very uncomfortable. They kept saying to me that Jordan didn't look, act, or speak like a scientist. Linda Jordan is not just an African-American female biochemist. She grew up poor on welfare in Roxbury, Massachusetts. She is shown in the video as walking through the housing project where she grew up. Her voice is powerful and articulate but sometimes it betrays her working class origin. Her journey to becoming a scientist is, one, is definitely one of overcoming one obstacle after another. She was first introduced to chemistry in high school through the uh, Upward Bound program at Brandeis University. From there, she earned an undergraduate degree from North Carolina A&T and a master's degree from Atlanta University, both historically black colleges. In the PhD program at MIT, she encountered she had her first encounter with racism in science. She became the target of harassment by her fellow students who simply took her experiment apart and destroyed her data. And one of her MIT colleagues said that, well, Jordan was always kind of different. She spoke differently. People thought she was less competent than she actually was. And in addition, she seemed to be too proud of her black heritage. As, and as a result, her colleagues at MIT didn't like to talk to her. Uh, yet, at the, the episode uh, with her experiment reveals that she was simultaneously undermined and also perceived as a threat to her colleagues. And despite the setback to her research, she completed her PhD. And it wasn't until she was doing postdoctoral work at the Pasteur Institute in Paris that she had her first experience of working in a supportive, multiracial scientific community. And one of the interesting elements about the film that my students always picked up on is that all the discussion about Jordan is, is provided by whites, especially if it's about her work. A white male colleague explains why her re research is significant. Her mentor in Paris explains why she chose her research project. Joyce Jordan is most often shown teaching, interacting with students. As no point is she shown interacting with other scientists. Though she's had many job offers at major universities after completing her doctorate, she chose to return to North Carolina A&T because she said she couldn't imagine having a career at a place like MIT that was so unwelcoming and unaccepting to her. So everybody in the, all the commentators in the video constantly remark about how hard she works, uh, what a great teacher she is. No one directly acknowledges the implications of the structural barriers she faced. Raising money to build a lab, lack of other colleagues in her field, the lack of scientific colleagues in general, having to work with young and inexperienced students, and her comments about needing to be uh, accepted. So I interviewed Jordan while she was a visiting professor at MIT, and I asked her about this video. I said, what did you think of that? And with tears in her eyes, she said, nobody understood why I wanted to be a scientist. Nobody understands what excites me about my work and why I work so hard. Um, and so Jordan's story is complicated. It's a difficult one. 
because over the, her whole career, her colleagues still kept her at a distance and few attempted to engage with her research. And her story is a complicated one, like many sci stories of scientists often are. On the one hand, she deeply believed that if she was good at her work, she would be accepted in the community of scientists. Yet on the other hand, it is difficult for her to acknowledge that she had been good at her work all along. But the mark of difference that she bore continued to shape perceptions of her among her scientific colleagues. In the video, by showing her interacting more outside of the lab than within it, by failing to name the racism and sexism she encountered, by failing to, to try to at least understand in any way the scientific content of her work, this reproduced the marginalization that she experienced in science. It was her gender, her race, her class that made her different, and these were marks she can't change. There's nothing she can do about it. And so in that world, Jordan couldn't pass. She couldn't pass for being something other than what she was. And that, I think, speaks to this issue of marginalization that I've been trying to capture in my own work. How to explain how people who are good at science, and in the science, of course, what we all learn very early, your race, your sex, your gender, your ethnicity, your culture should have no predictive value as to whether or not you can be successful in science. It should be your talent, your insight, your creativity, your willingness to work hard. Those are the things we tell ourselves, that those are the absolute marks that you need to have in order to be a successful science, scientist or engineer. But Jordan's story tell us, tells us that that's not the whole story. And that's not the whole story for many women of color in science. So what I'm trying to say is that by not attending to the specific history of women of color in science, and in my case, particularly African-American women, and by using practices that expound identity as this kind of either or position, you either have to be this way in order to be a scientist, it can't be that way, um, science studies has relegated and the identity of women of color to a location that resists telling. We can't even begin to explain um, their stories in many ways. And so that means we don't fully understand or describe or articulate the structures of social relations within scientific communities. We often focus on exceptional women, but those mask the ways scientific communities also mirror specific other uh, political formations. And also, we know that to become a scientist, you're socialized through a long process, an educational process, but also a community process. For example, an outsider looking at a physics lab will be hard pressed to identify the director of the lab, the postdoc, the graduate student, and undergraduate students and technicians by any outward difference in dress or behavior, which used to drive my mother crazy. Because she would see me, and I have on a t-shirt, I had a short afro, I have a t-shirt, jeans, high top converse. And she was like, why do you dress like that? I said, but everybody in my lab dresses like this. And she'd say, but don't you people ever wear like nice clothes? I, no, mom, you got to work in the lab. You don't wear nice clothes to the lab. Why did I believe that so deeply? To the point of almost thinking, if I did wear nice clothes, I probably couldn't work. You're shaking your head. Like, you understand, right? It's a, it's, that's, that's, a, that's something happening in the culture that says, some other things are required to be accepted and a trustworthy knowledge producer in that community. That's about something about dress, something about style, something about what we now call geekiness or nerdiness, some things like that, that don't fit everybody in the same way, right? Or why do we believe that having cultures defined in certain kinds of ways are the best ways to get science done? Those are the kind of questions I'm interested in understanding. I had a friend, I had a, a graduate student who did a, a short study, and she claimed that one of the other things in scientific labs and, and other kinds of labs is people have to pretend they're there all the time. <laughs> right? See, you guys know this. You know I'm saying, right? Right. Okay, so she figured out that a couple of guys in her lab, what they would do is they would put their hoodies or sweaters on different parts of the lab, and they turned the radio to the station they liked, but they weren't there. <laughs> but you would think they were there. So, the, so the, the, the leader of the lab would come in and say, oh, everybody's here. Nobody was there. 
But it looked like there would be a little bit of lunch left over, the right station, a hoodie there, sweater there, somebody stuffed in the corner. But people weren't there all the time. But why do you have to pretend to be there all the time? What demand is that upon the work, right? What connection? Is it a real connection to how you do the work? Is it really important? Does everybody have to participate in that to be considered a viable member of that community, even just the lab? So I'm asking, what do we demand? What does science and engineering demand of people who would be knowledge producers in these fields? That's part of what I think we have to unpack, we have to explore, we have to begin to articulate, make visible, so that we can, this is the kind of thing that I think we have to understand that by developing a complex analysis of race and gender within science, science communities, it requires a great deal of work, but I would argue that this work is important because it will help us understand how science and engineering and technical fields actually work and help prepare people better to be in those communities and change them if necessary. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Since I broke the microphone, I don't know yeah, what else to do. Oh, My experiment, yes. Yeah, I was, the Linda, that happened to Linda Jordan too, but it had happened to me too. So what happened was I worked in uh, laser physics and it takes a very long time to align the mirrors of your laser so that you're actually getting the right beam and everything that you need, the optics absolutely correct. It takes a lot of time and it's very important. So there was a guy in my lab who was older than I was who said, I, I come in one morning and my laser is completely taken apart. And he said, I said, what happened? And he said, you used my wrench. And I said, the wrench is yours? Does that mean all the tools around here are yours? He said, yes. OK. So I went to see my advisor, and I said, I have to have money to get tools, because Marty says all the tools belong to him. And he said, he looked at my face, and telling later, he said, uh, he just knew he better just go let me go buy tools, because I was very <laughs> angry. And so I had. Uh, so I went and got my own tools, the whole thing. And um, then I had a friend of mine uh, who was a big guy, big football player. And I asked him to come to the lab door and just stand there. And as I was talking to, my, to Marty about this, I said, and you know what? If you ever do that again, you see that guy over there? He's going to come in, and he's going to beat you up. <laughs> and you know, and I tell my mother that story. My mother said, you never hit anyone in your life. I said, I wasn't going to hit him. I was going to make Calvin hit him. <laughs> But even threatening, she couldn't believe that. She said, what is happening to you? So, no, it's really, I mean, for me, it was a moment of, 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 of that kind of, he was exercise, trying to exercise complete control over me. And I knew what I needed to do to do my work. And, what was, what was, and that was a very clear demarcation that he was willing to, to take away me as competition to him or anything by taking apart my experiment. And I think Linda felt that way as well and not, you know, I certainly grew up in a household where my mother asked me to stand up for myself. She didn't want me to hit anybody, but she did want me to stand up for myself, and that's what I took from that lesson, that he would go to such great lengths to stop me from doing my work. Sure. Dr. Hunt, thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. I was intrigued. Um, earlier in your talk, you said that you didn't like to use the term Python. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your perspective on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting at the earliest ages to get mm -hmm. to what mm -hmm. you're talking about today. Right. So what's your so, well, my objection to a notion of a pipeline is suggest that there's a, a just a certain set of not necessarily clearly articulated hurdles that you jump through to become a scientist. 
And if you jump through those hurdles in a certain way, you, go through, you, you flow right through the pipe from beginning to end. And that's, that's how it works. I'm not sure that's how scientists are produced or engineers are produced. Simply by, excuse me, jumping through a set of hurdles or going, following a particularly strict format that comes out at the end and you're officially a scientist and engineer. I think it's far more complicated than that. And, and, and I, I wrote a paper once called How Scientists Are Made. I don't think scientists are made that way. It's very important uh, in critical moments for people to have e effective mentors. They have to have uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, familiar and other kinds of support. They have people, they have, you have to have someone who's a collaborator that you can help sort of develop your ideas. I also once did a, um, a, I do, my studies aren't double blind, completely quantitative kinds of studies. What I did was I went to the library and I took out 10 autobiographies of Nobel Prize winners. And I read them and I wanted to know what they thought was the most important or single event that helped them become the scientists they became. And it had nothing to do with the formal things. It had everything to do with interesting collaborators, mentors who thought they were smart, believed in them, who thought, yeah, take that bi big risk. I'll be with you. And those are the kinds of things that they themselves marked, usually at the end of their careers when they wrote these autobiographies, that were the most important things that happened. And so the pipeline doesn't capture that for me. And so I, I think, because I don't think there's a dearth of scientific or technical curiosity among children that's somehow natural. I mean, if you put, take a bunch of five-year-olds and take them to the Museum of Science in Boston and let them run around and touch everything, they all run around and touch everything and tear everything apart. The, then what we do is we don't build on that interest, that creativity, that they, that's just really natural curiosity. We don't build on it to help more and more of our students really begin to have a serious understanding of science and technology. You're welcome. Are there any others studies? Are there any like are there any fields for women of color to be more interested in, more marginalized than like for instance in medicine, for instance computer science? Is there any Well, I, I think right now a lot of people are looking at uh, computer science for obvious reasons because the, the tech sector is very, very important to our economy and a lot of innovation occurring. So a lot of people are looking at computer science, and it's pretty bad in computer science for women of color. Um, and so places like Google and uh, Facebook and a lot of other uh, of the big companies are putting, Microsoft, for example, are doing a lot, a lot of work to try to change their cultures to make it possible for more women to do that work. So I do think that some women experience computer science as being, you know, maybe a modicum more difficult than, than other fields. Physics is still pretty bad as well. But so that's what I would say. Um, Evelyn, I know that you're focused on being an African American um, woman in science, mm -hmm. but Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think what, what I've tried to do, uh, so um, um, uh, Angela Genorio and I uh, did a short project where we brought in um, about, I think it was about 15 women of color, that was African American and Latina, to, uh, to MIT to a conference, a short just sort of workshop kind of meeting. And th th there were so many parallels. There's very little substantial difference. Um, between uh, the experiences of, of, of Latinas and African American women, especially in the biological sciences where there are increasing numbers of both groups in those fields, but they're still having a hard time getting to the top of the field. So, yes. I have two questions. So okay. My first question is what actually made you choose a career in science? I love science. I love it. I still love it. So. You know, I keep, ref I keep, I keep, yes, I keep referencing my mother, but there was a Christmas when my sister and I, my sister's four years younger, and we both got new watches for Christmas, so I immediately took hers apart. <laughs> what? And my mother said, what'd you do? I said, I wasn't going to take mine apart. <laughs> right? It didn't make sense, right? So, I mean, my parents really encouraged my curiosity about the world. 
Um, and so I had chemistry sets and microscopes and all that kind of things and telescopes. And they just really supported me. I really had no idea that there was something odd about my interest in science until I got to college. And that was a long way where I, I just did these kinds of things because they interested me. Um, and I liked watching science shows. And, and you know, in Atlanta, we didn't really have a very good science museum. But I often got to go to New York City, and I would go to museums there. I, I just, it, it just, that, 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 that was my thing. And I really, tr un, I really get very excited about trying to understand how different things work and how the world works, how the natural world works. So it was just, it was just, I was, ha it was my own curiosity, but it was having parents who nurtured that curiosity. So my second question is, so you graduated from Stony College as undergrad, right? So my advisor for my master's degree program, she graduated from Spelman as well. And she really encouraged me to go and get my PhD. I mean, like she was very, I don't want to say hard on me, but you know, she, there was like that structure, right? And after a while, like I got my master's degree, I went and taught at Spelman College Biology Labs at that point in time, and I understood her a lot better at, after teaching at Spelman and understanding the way they teach at Spelman, the way they teach their students. And I was wondering, so she really encouraged me to go back and get my PhD, and I got my PhD two years ago. I was wondering if there was a, any type of study that shows, sort of tracks the people who graduated from HBCUs and got their doctorates, and then the PhD students, they're kind of churning out after that, you know, sort of tracking that progress of the effect of the HBCUs. So there have been, there've been some limited studies, and one of the things that is, is going to happen um, in November, finally, the Committee on Women in Science and Engineering and Medicine of the National Academies is hosting a workshop on women of color in STEM uh, in November. And the whole focus of it is going to be um, to look at the kinds of practices that help uh, women of color overcome barriers and, uh, and challenge and, and get more opportunities in STEM fields, but also a big data collection project. The data collection project is what the women asked for in 1975. And it's been very difficult and, and pro too complicated for me to explain right now of, of for us to get the kind of data we need to really see who is producing, what kinds of institutions are producing women of color in science and engineering, and what institutions are not. And so we need that information. And so we finally, I think, have Rita Caldwell, who's the chair of that committee, was a former director of the National Science Foundation. She's committed to that project. And so I think in a, in a year or so, we're going to finally have that kind of data. So I think we should leave, uh, leave it at that and we'll have a lot of individual questions. Thanks for joining me and thank you.